Welcome to today's webinar, How the Bots Act Impacts Premium on Sales and the Ticketing Industry Ecosystem. My name is Elias Terman. I'm VP of Marketing at Distill Networks, and I'll be moderating today's event. Today I'm joined by Rami Assad, co-founder and CEO at Distill Networks, the leaders in bot detection and mitigation, and Nell Sodeman, the founder and CEO of Qit, which provides an online queue page that brings fairness for transactional websites and their end users. On today's agenda, first we'll make sure everyone has a baseline understanding of good bots and bad bots. We'll dive into the Bots Act to understand what it covers and what it doesn't cover. We'll dig into how bots impact the different players in the ticketing ecosystem, and we'll end with a StubHub case study as well as a question and answer period. To kick things off, I'll ask each of our panelists to briefly tell us who they are and what they do. Rami, let's start with you. I'm Rami Assad, co-founder and CEO of Distill Networks. We are the first and best um, bot detection mitigation solution. We help companies across the globe identify the difference between real people and automated traffic across their website, mobile, mobile apps, and their APIs. And Nils. And uh, Nils. Yeah, Nils from uh, Qt in Denmark, uh, CEO and co-founder. We have been around for six years now and have developed a virtual waiting room that are used in uh, a lot of industry and uh, being in ticketing as uh, one of the primary things we are doing. We have on the other side of uh, 200 uh, ticketing clients around the globe and are doing on the other side of 100 uh, on sales uh, each week. Fantastic. I see there's some, some uh, awards here that Distill Networks uh, has won. Maybe you could tell us about them, Rami, and uh, some of the ways that uh, you help customers. So we've helped customers across multiple verticals, including travel, e-commerce, and very specifically with ticketing, identify bad bots uh, that are doing a lot of malicious things. And we'll talk about the different malicious things that bots can do, but we've helped pioneer this category of anti-automation or um, user behavior analytics, and uh, we've received accolades from Gartner, 451, Ovum, and, and many more. Great. So, you know, how did you two get together? I know, you know, Nails, you're in Denmark. Rami, you're in San Francisco. So how did the two of you kind of, uh, you know, get together to tell this story? Rami, maybe you want to want to start. Yep. Well, I think the 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 synergy between the two of us. We're both trying to help online ticket brokers provide the best possible user experience for the true fan that wants to get a ticket to a show. Um, Niels's company helps uh, helps uh, in one way, and we help filter out the, the scalpers and the scrapers that are trying to unfairly game the system. And together, we just saw the, the best synergy. And it was brought together by a couple of mutual customers. Customers were using us in tandem to solve their on-sale problem. And we just realized that uh, we were two pieces that, that fit well together into a, into a, a better user experience. Fantastic. Um, so. Rami, why don't you give us just level set everyone, give us an overview of you know what is a bot, what are good bots, bad bots, just to make sure everyone has a baseline understanding. Bots, bots aren't always nefarious, and it's, it's a good thing to understand what a bot is um, as we go through and, and talk about the Bots Act and, and how it's impacting uh, online ticket brokerages. Um, first thing, a, a bot is just any automated computer program that that it goes to a website and simulates a real person. And so there is a lot of legitimate bot traffic that exists on the web. You can think of search engines, or you can think of your DevOps tools or site availability tools, Facebook, LinkedIn. All of these have legitimate bots that you want to give access to your web infrastructure. But then there is a nefarious side to bots where bots can be used to steal content perform price scraping, or scalp tickets. And that accounts for about one in five users on your website is an illegitimate or malicious bot. And that 
that is a, a, a stark number for, for a lot of people to recognize that 20% um, of their website traffic is m potentially malicious um, that they may have not had any insight into. Interesting. And this will take us to our first poll, actually, but first of two. We're going to do them right, right in sequence here. Um, and so you should see this on your screen right now. Uh, and the first poll question is, um, what concerns you most about the impact of bots on your organization's website? And if everyone could, uh, you know, answer that poll question, and we'll, we'll show the results uh, right now. All right, let's share the results. So it looks like uh, the main concerns were uh, website security at 16%, transaction fraud at 53%, lost revenue to scalpers at 38%, and poor customer experience at 50%. Um, any surprises here? Uh, Nels, what, what do you think of these results? Do these uh, kind of jive with what you were thinking? Uh, it, it pretty much is. Uh, like uh, especially the last one uh, will in uh, primary ticketing drive a lot of uh, unhappy users to your social media and therefore it is obviously something you, you really want to be in top of. How about you, Rami? Any thoughts on this on this poll? Anything uh, pop out at you? You know, I'm really glad that so many people uh, care about the user experience because at the end of the day, I, this is this is what it's all coming down to. This is the problem that we're trying to solve is that legitimate users want to be able to access the tickets fairly and at a reasonable price for the artists that they care about. Um, that's, that's what the Bots Act is, is trying to solve. That's what artists are clamoring for. That's what the end, end users are, are, are clamoring for. So if we don't keep that, that logic in, in mind as we're, we're talking about all the different things that, that we're trying to do technologically, then we're going to lose sight of, of the real objective. So I, I love seeing that that is a top priority on everybody's mind. Great. All right, so we have our second, and this is actually our last poll, um, which is how are you addressing uh, these concerns? So if everyone could uh, take a moment and uh, fill out uh, those, uh, that, that question, and we'll, we'll present the results live to the audience. All right, let's share the results. Okay, looks like about a third of folks are addressing now, another third plan to address it this year, and kind of the rest are either, you know, a little farther out in the future or aren't quite sure. Uh, Rami, what's your take on, uh, on some of these, on these results? It's great that two-thirds of, of people have a plan to tackle this and, and fix it or are thinking about putting a plan into motion this year. Um, that's that's fantastic. It's it's a, a critical thing to, to be thinking about, and it sounds like the majority of the audience wants to educate themselves more about what they're doing versus what they they had planned to do. Um, hopefully, we can influence the last third of people to really step up and, and take action of some sort. Uh, the the I don't know is I'd love to convert them to hand raisers that want to uh, take a meaningful step towards improving their user experience. Okay, great. And that, that completes our polls, and let's uh, continue on with the presentation here. Um, so let's, let's get into the Bots, the bots Act. Um, Rami, take it away. So the Bots Act came out um, late last year. It was, uh, it was based on legislation that came out of New York State. Uh, last, in, early in 2016, New York State passed state legislation that made it illegal for ticket brokers to buy tickets and resell them using bots. Uh, they, they essentially, they made online ticket scalping illegal. Uh, they made it punishable by a fine and by potential jail time uh, in, in New York State. That didn't go far enough. What they found, they were able to prosecute a couple of ticket scalpers and they made a very big splash in the news. But what they realized soon after was that the ticket scalpers simply had to go across the border, across the state, and, and they became immune to the legislation that New York State had passed. And so Senator Schumer um, sponsored, that uh, being the, the Democratic senator from New York, sponsored a very similar legislation 
in the U.S. Um, uh, to, to, to go into the U.S. Congress. And, and that act passed in December, signed by President Obama, and, and it's, it's now law. The difference between New York State's law and, and the, the federal law is that the federal law lost a lot of the meat behind it. it the, there's no criminal responsibility, and the, the, the enforcement of the policy it just simply enables FCC to go a, FCC to go after um, nefarious ticket scalpers, and, and so there's two key pro, provisions in the, the the federal law that came out. It pro, one it prohibits the circumvention of security measures to prevent somebody from buying bo tickets online with bots. So what what that means in layman's terms is if you create some sort of mechanism on your website to prevent somebody from using bots to buy and sell tickets and somebody circumvents that, then that is a violation of this law and it is illegal. Um, the second provision is that it prohibits of a sale of tickets that were obtained by violating the first provision. So if you, if you circumvent the, 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 the automation, anti-automation technique, and you buy tickets, and then you go and resell them, then that is a double violation of, of this law. So, so the, the, the first and most important thing for everybody to understand is that for this law to be federally enforced, for the FCC to be able to take any action, you as a website ho owner, as the, the online broker, have to have some sort of mechanism in place that prevents automation prevents people from using bots. That is the first and foremost um, piece of the legislation. They can't take any action if you aren't taking any action against the bots. Now, it, it doesn't empower you to, to, to go after the, the nefarious actors. It allows them to do so, but they need you to be able to, um, to, to take that action. Now, one thing that you'll see that's missing here is any language in the act talking about how they go about doing this, how they're going to go about um, going after these guys. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But, but let's talk about these, these uh, ticket scalping bots. What, what are they? So in the next slide, we'll see that, that the, the ticket scalping bots, um, they're categorized by the, um, the nonprofit agency, OWASP, and they, they, they're talk, they, they come in a couple of forms, scalping, sniping, spinning, um, and I'll, I'll describe what each of these things mean because it's, it's a little bit unique of a, of a bot. Um, scalping is just simply buying tickets with a bot. Um, it's, it's the act of buy, programming a bot to buy a ticket. Um, that's, that's what most of us know. That's the verbiage that a lot of us know. What, what people don't understand, especially when you look at uh, some of the survey responses that came in and asked about and said, we care about lost revenue or to, due to fraudulent uh, transactions, that's where you start seeing some of the other bots really take um, extra foothold. So a, a sniping bot is a bot that sits there and watches your inventory. And it, it waits until the inventory is almost sold out and then buys the last bit of inventory, knowing that once there's zero inventory left, then, then they can charge a premium for that inventory, as opposed to scalpers that just want to go into a brand new on sale and get as many tickets as they can as quickly as possible. Snipers are waiting till the very end and trying to optimize on zero availability. And then there's a third and even more nefarious type of bot, which is a spinner bot. And these, I think, are the absolute worst. Instead of committing any revenue, the spinner bot can hold tickets in your shopping cart and they repost them in secondary markets. And they simply hold that inventory, making it unavailable to other people on your site and anywhere else until somebody buys it from a secondary site. And then the spinner bot automatically makes that transaction. They put zero risk, zero amount of their own dollars in and simply hold inventory long enough to be able to transact in other places. Now you think, Oh, well, that's okay. We have a timer on our shopping cart. We have a, uh, a mechanism to clear it out. Well, these spinner bots can operate at superhuman speed. So they can release a ticket, clear their cookies, go back, add that ticket, and hold that ticket all over again when the timer runs out in a matter of seconds. And so it's a very, very obstructive bot 
that is impeding real people from accessing your tickets and simply creating margin off of your hard work and putting extra strain on your infrastructure. So those are the, the types of bots that exist. And what you'll find is that these bots have a, a moderate sophistication level. There's a lot of different types of bots and it, they, they range from very unsophisticated bots that, that create denial of service attacks and take out your infrastructure to very, very advanced bots that have that, that do credit card fraud or account takeovers. But these spinners, scalpers, and snipers are about the moderate range. So you don't need, you don't need a, a, a team of people constantly looking out to prevent these. An automated solution will be more than enough to handle these bots. But an in-house solution that's simply IP-based or is looking at a, a WAF or static rule sets is not going to be enough. Um, it, it's a, more sophisticated than what a WAF can handle, but it doesn't need a dedicated team to constantly adapt. It's, it's right there in that middle. And, you know, going back to the legislation, it's not just the U.S. that's looking at this as a, as a problem. We've done interviews in Canada, UK, the EU, lots of other countries are, are looking at this and seeing that this is a problem for their constituents. Um, in, the, in the UK, there's already a House of Commons um, amendment that addresses this problem, and they're looking at actually strengthening that amendment in 2017. So be on the lookout for more legislation to come in the UK. Canada is considering legislation. And, and so you have a lot of Western countries that are actively taking a stance against this. Um, the, the other most uh, important part here to remember is all the places that haven't taken legislation um, to act on it, South America, uh, Asia, and, and in those countries, act, nefarious actors that are, that are outside of the reach of the legislation that exists are immune to this. So uh, it, it, this isn't a problem that can be solved just with legislation, and this is, I think, the most important point. When we think back to how do we make sure that we're solving the problem for the end user. What is the problem that we want to solve? We want to make sure that real users are able to buy tickets for their artists, that they're happy with the, your site and the interaction. Well, laws aren't going to fix it because if somebody's sitting in China and they, and they uh, run bots, the law can't reach them. And so we have, to, we have to go a step beyond the law to really make this a meaningful fix for, for the users. And let's talk about how this impacts you. So with primary ticketing, I mentioned earlier, you must have protections. Right now it's not mandatory that it, the, the, the law hasn't mandated that you have to install some anti-automation measures, but if you, but it, you'll, we are confident in, in talking to legislatures that, let, that if this doesn't fix the problem, if the FCC finds that they can't prosecute people because there are no anti-bot automation, uh, uh, tools deployed on your website that this will be the first thing to change that they will mandate that practice that, that primary ticket ticketing sites try to stop bots in some sort of fashion and and my perspective is always that um, it's better to get out ahead of legislation because it's it's a, always a coin flip if Congress is going to get it right or wrong if they mandate that you take some sort of action the last thing you want to do is that they mandate that you put a CAPTCHA on every single one of your users or that they, they mandate some more obtrusive mechanism that impacts the conversion rate of your shopping cart. You, we don't want them to, to guess and pick how we should have the protection. So um, you taking a passive um, tra transparent protection is, is critical um, to be able to make this enforceable. And the second piece is you have to be prepared for those FCC audits. I mentioned earlier, what is, what, how are they going to enforce this? How are they going to go after these bad guys? Well, the FCC is going to start with you. They're going to hand you a list of transactions, a list of tickets. They're going to hand you a list of IPs, and they're going to say, show us if it's a bot or not. And you're going to have to do the, do the, the, the logging, the digging up, the, the identification. You're going to have to do the forensics of understanding, was this a bot, was this not? It's not going to fall on their team. It's going to fall on your IP team. Um, so if you want to avoid that, that audit, if you want to avoid the disruption, having something 
in place ahead of time where you can simply export the data, hand it over to the FCC and say, here you go, we did our part. Um, that will be a, a huge lifesaver for, for your IT team to try to avoid that interrupt. Now, it, some people are thinking, well, you know what, I'm not a primary ticketing site, I'm a secondary ticketing site, what is, it, it doesn't really mean anything to me. Well, that, that's not true. You, the, the secondary ticketing sites fall under the same legislation as well. They didn't distinguish between primary on sales and tech, secondaries. Um, so they care just as much about secondary ticketing as they do about primary. Um, not to mention, you're going to have a little extra hurdle on the FCC audits because what's going to happen is you're going to actually they're going to come to you with the tickets and they want to match up the the, your, the the secondary sales to the primary on sale so making sure that you're speaking the same language as the primary on sale is going to be really helpful in catching anybody that has that is listing their sites in secondary that might have purchased them illegally through some sort of bot in, in the primary ticketing. So it, 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 I, we think that the FTC uh, audits are going to be even more burdensome on the secondary ticketing sites. And now the final piece, and I think probably one of the most important people that this impacts are the venues, the artists, et cetera. And what you're going to see is, as most venues, a lot of them feel helpless to, to help. You're now seeing more and more artists demanding that you have some sort of measure to protect those those on sales, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Hamilton or the Harry Potter play, um, you, the, all the big new on sales, um, or if you have Beyonce coming to town or any any major on sale, the venue is now being tasked with mandating that that they have some sort of protection in place, and 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 so can you enforce that? Can you comply? It may not be up to you, it may be up to your technology partner, but that's where you have to be vocal about what technology partner you pick and making sure that they have the technologies in place, thinking out ahead uh, to, to make sure that you're going to be ready to handle the, the next big on sale and, and the demand from those, those on sale um, artists that, that you have some sort of measurement in place. Um, at the end of the day, the, the BOTS Act was actually pushed forward by these artists. So, uh, a, almost a co-sponsor of the BOTS Act was Lynn manuel because he was so tired of the scalpers making money off of the backs of his play and, and, and not allowing legitimate people to buy the tickets. The, the, it was estimated that scalpers made tens of millions of dollars off of Hamilton. That's tens of millions of dollars that didn't go to the cast and crew, that didn't go to the uh, to Lynn manuel and that the end user had to pay extra to be able to afford and, and go see the play. And that's really what this is all about. Now, Niels, I think what, what's interesting here is, is not just what, what it does cover, but maybe what's missing in the BOTS Act. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that are extremely important to remember here is that the BOTS Act uh, that are enforced in, in U.S. does not address uh, all the things around uh, scalping and the money disappearing from the table. One of the things that are uh, very clear is that it's not illegal to buy and resell uh, the tickets. And uh, there is also a lot of historical relationships between the primary ticketing business and the secondary uh, market where uh, some part of the inventory is actually moved uh, from primary to secondary without uh, touching uh, end uh, users and, and their fans. And that is, of course, uh, very important for the entire discussion to understand that this is not uh, purely about the technology, but a part of the money disappearing from the table uh, is actually uh, out of the reach of the uh, fans who want to uh, come to the uh, artist or the concert or whatever is going on. Uh, if you can uh, go to the next slide, uh, because here we have a, a very good explanation coming from a guy who was one of the notorious uh, bad uh, scalper guys running a operation called Wise Guy. This uh, Ken uh, Lawson from Wise Guy have actually turned uh, into being a good guy now uh, after have been uh, convicted. 
are running a, a company now trying to basically help the industry with all the knowledge you have about what they uh, were able to pull off uh, back in the uh, good and happy days. They uh, basically uh, emptied a lot of the huge uh, uh, on sales uh, using a combination of, of uh, technology and knowledge about uh, the different uh, platforms around. Uh, if you click on uh, the link afterwards, you could see a very uh, comprehensive uh, storytelling about uh, what they did and, and how smart they were, and also uh, how many of the tickets they were actually able to pull away from uh, some of the uh, very uh, big uh, on sale with uh, international uh, artists. Uh, yeah, go uh, next uh, slide here because there, there is a little bit of explanation on, on uh, how they actually did it. They were running a operation with uh, young people coming in uh, and were sitting once they were uh, starting the on sales and made a, a combination of, of using uh, humans and uh, IT technology basically to bypass uh, some of the security mechanisms uh, especially on uh, one of the, the big primary uh, ticketing uh, platforms by uh, simply fooling the capture that were uh, in place at that time. That capture uh, had only uh, 30,000 different uh, uh, words and they uh, simply just spent a lot of time on solving all 30,000 and put it into a database and therefore they were able to bypass the capture in milliseconds and also like run a lot of scripts that were able in the second that they were allowed into the ticketing pass to actually do the reservations on uh, the tickets. They uh, simply just uh, uh, got all the, the best tickets away from the uh, site and did the uh, reselling immediately after and earned a lot of uh, money. Um, they were again convicted and um, uh, are now here helping the industry really to understand uh, what uh, went on uh, back in the, the happy days and therefore giving us and, and uh, everybody in the industry a clear indication on uh, how huge and big the issue actually is. Yep. Yeah, just uh, go to the next one. And there, there is, of, uh, of course, still a, a lot of uh, these uh, uh, platforms uh, up running now where uh, what Rami explained with the, especially the spinners, where uh, the tickets go directly from the primary ticketing site and, and into where uh, the reselling uh, can begin. And uh, uh, there is, uh, we have counted at least 10 different websites where you can buy uh, the robots and technology that you need to uh, to use to actually be able to either snipe or spin uh, tickets away from uh, any of the major uh, uh, selling uh, sites. And as you can see, we're talking about prices down to uh, uh, maybe $1,000. So really cheap tools that uh, can uh, get tickets away from uh, any of the uh, larger uh, sites uh, using technology. And sorry, I was yeah. saying, I, I think that's a really great point to highlight there um, that, that you're talking about is that this isn't an expensive endeavor for the bad guys. The bad guys can do it for a, as little as a thousand dollars, and there's pre built tools for your directly made for your site. The, they're, 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 it, it's practically open source solutions to defeat you. And, and one of the things that I challenge people. Everybody on this call, look up your specific venue or your specific um, technology broker and type in technology broker space bot or spinner bot. And I'm willing to bet that you'll find if you go to ticketbots.net or if you go to one of these other sites, you're going to find a piece of technology that's built specifically to defeat you. And, and, and that should be concerning to you. If somebody's already ahead of you and, and can automate the, the process, then whatever you're doing in-house may not be working and it's worth investigating a little bit deeper. Yeah. And, and the, the other side of, of uh, sort of running the operation on, and talking about the cost side is that uh, all the human factor that maybe needs to go into this here can be outside, uh, outsourced uh, outside uh, the Western European countries 
and running, for example, a operation where you are having like hundred guys sitting in in China uh, for those two hours, where where you actually have the big on sale, is really a small cost compared to the potential upside of getting, uh, let's say, just uh, one thousand tickets away from a primary ticketing sale. Yeah. And, and if you can go to the uh, next one here. So uh, th th this is just a very fast explanation to one of the learnings uh, that, that we have actually uh, gotten here over the years when we have been working in primary ticketing. And that is that the time from you start the on sale and until every ticket is sold uh, is not a function of how much IT infrastructure you have but it's a function of the time out on the basket or cart that you have in your system. And it basically is uh, something like uh, uh, the following. If your timer uh, on your uh, cart is 10 minutes, it will probably take on the other side of 20 minutes to sell each ticket. And by selling, meaning that there is an end user with a credit card buying the tickets in the other end. And you can basically turn this around and say that each time you hear about a on sale where all the tickets are sold out in a half a minute or one minute, there's something else going on. And that can be anything from uh, tickets being uh, removed from the inventory. It can be that they are actually sniped up by robots. So just keep this in mind here that the um, minimum time to sell all, all tickets when it's end users is a function of the cut timeout, and it's probably on the other side of 20 minutes. And we have not seen anybody uh, around our customer on the global scale who uh, uh, sort of contradict uh, this uh, timeline. And if you go into the link uh, later, you will see a lot of uh, additional detail on, on all this here. And that basically means that uh, the guy here is uh, pointing at uh, you as a, a ticketing uh, operator or venue. And uh, uh, you would be simply responsible for uh, making sure that your end users will uh, have uh, the, let's say, the perfect user journey uh, and that any fraudulent uh, activity will be stopped by uh, measures that you have in place. Uh, if you go to uh, the next uh, slide, uh, the, the next one again here, what we have tried uh, here to explain a little bit about uh, some of the measures where uh, Distill and, and Qt can help you. Uh, we have uh, defined a timeline and on that uh, timeline, if you can go to the next slide, we have tried to build a timeline uh, around a 10 a.m. Uh, start of an on sale. And on that timeline, you can see that there is a lot of activities that uh, goes into uh, making the fraud here that comes prior to the actual on sale. We have a set of activities that uh, goes on while you are waiting uh, until you can come in and start the user journey towards buying the tickets, and then there is a part of the user journey uh, after you are uh, coming out of the waiting room or uh, start the user journey where a lot of uh, additional activity uh, can uh, go on. And uh, I'll put it over here to Rami to explain a little bit about the first part here prior to the on sale. Yeah, and thanks, Niels. I, I think that's a great point. Is that when you think about the journey of 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 a from the perspective of one single on sale, uh, the 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 fraud and the bad the nefarious actors start well before this on sale. It, it starts with a number of different things. The first is it starts with a lot of account creation. They want to automate and distribute to have as many accounts as possible because they know that one of the easiest way for you guys to limit how many t tickets somebody can buy is by limiting the number of account by limiting it per account. So the account creation piece can't happen right as the on sale is going on. The account creation piece happens well before on sales get started. Now they a, a lot of times this can be done manually, but 
to create enough accounts for to have enough bots, it makes it a lot easier to simply automate this process. And so bots are the very first step in account creation and creating a, a number of fake accounts. If a lot of people have realized that new accounts are more potentially fraudulent and they put restrictions on new accounts. And so the bad guys to get around this, you'll find take an extra step of doing a lot of account takeovers instead of worrying about creating new accounts. If they can leverage existing in good standing accounts, then they have a leg up in this game of fraud. Um, and, and so account takeovers is one of the most prolific attacks that you'll find on ticketing sites. It's again categorized by the OWASP um, nonprofit group and it, it involves taking a list of known usernames and passwords from all the major breaches that we've seen around the globe. Yahoo, Ashley Madison, Dropbox, etc. There are over 1.5 billion compromised usernames and passwords. The bad guys take that list and upload it into bots and run that list against your site. And what you'll find is that so many people use the same username and password everywhere they go that up to 1-3% to of the stolen credentials still will work on your website. If you're not sure, go download one of these lists and run it against your database. You'll find very, very quickly that a lot of your accounts can be very easily compromised through this method of automation. And so that account takeover problem is one of the most prevalent ways that bots impact, um, impact online ticketing sites. If, if you look at the, the next slide, it's not just about scalping. Account takeover goes well beyond that. And we go back to the survey that we had up front. Half of you guys are worried about financial losses because of bots. Um, and so it's not just about ticket scalpers. It's also about financial fraud through account takeover. It's about spam. It's about phishing. It's about protecting your end users from these malicious bad guys. And so what data is available behind an account that somebody can access? What um, are there stored payment methods that somebody can leverage? Are there, uh, is there personal identifiable information or can those, can those users be more likely to be fished and targeted because their account has been compromised? This goes back to, again, that central theme of protecting the end user experience. Um, to, 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 to highlight this point even further, breaches have t gotten to be an all-time high. Um, we've seen more breaches in the past several years than ever before, but 50% of online attacks start with these stolen credentials. Half of the, the issues that your fraud team and your web security teams are going to have to face in 2017 start with an account takeover. And that's, that's uh, according to uh, the Verizon Data Breach Report and a number of other um, security resources. So when you think about it that way, protecting against a account takeover will reduce the, the exposure to security and fraud risks by 50%. And that's, that's a huge, huge uh, uh, number there. Now, I mentioned earlier scalper bots were moderately advanced. Well, if you want to defend yourself effectively against the fraudsters that take over, that do account takeovers, the ones that are using those accounts to commit fraud, you got to step up your anti-automation game. These are very, very sophisticated bots that are running in real human browsers that can hold cookies, that can interact with your site. They can move a mouse and they can fake keyboard clicks. They can do everything a real user can do. And so the sophistication level of these technologies is much, much higher. So that's what happens leading up to the day of an on sale. You know, then 10 o'clock hits, you have a lot of users coming in. Niels, what, how does Qit come into this, this timeline? Yeah, so uh, basically uh, leading up to the uh, start of the on sale, and let's say it's a 10 a.m. start, we will normally start to take users into a system called a pre-queue, and we will do that, for example, half an hour 
prior to the start of the sale. And uh, this is basically to uh, defend against two of the vectors you uh, talked about here. So you have the vector uh, on, on trying to, to snap the tickets away where you, as a single entity or person, are simulating many different users, for example, with the accounts that you have taken over. And the other way that you can actually uh, use as a vector here is the speed. So you are getting into where you can start the reservation of the ticket prior to uh, anybody else. And just go to the next slide, uh, because on the volume uh, space or game here, we have uh, implemented a, a couple of things where uh, we are able to listen to the traffic coming from uh, single uh, devices or single um, uh, IP addresses. And we have a mechanism that are able to block very simple uh, uh, volume-based uh, tools coming into our system. It's relatively rudimentary, but it will take the uh, very simple tools away. And on some of, or most of the major on sale where we're talking about international uh, artists, maybe half of the traffic is actually coming from uh, uh, people trying uh, to uh, uh, come to our system using a simple uh, spinner robot, uh, typically uh, one of the uh, bots that you can uh, buy for, for cheap uh, money. So volume vector, we, we have uh, some tools uh, that, that are able to defend against uh, that part of the game. And then uh, the other and maybe more interesting uh, uh, thing here is on the speed vector. So if you go uh, to the uh, next slide, uh, we basically have a, and, and next again here, we basically have a tool that uh, prevent or uh, at least make it very difficult to get an advantage by being fast. And that tool is a switch between what we call a pre-queue and then into a live queue. And what we're doing is basically to take everybody who comes into the pre-queue and assign a queue identifier to them. And then we'll count down towards the 10 a.m. And what we will do with everybody who comes into that time frame is to give them a random position in line. So basically uh, uh, taking it in a way where there is no difference between being uh, there one second or one millisecond before 10 a.m. or half an hour before the start of the on sale. Everybody will get a random number and uh, therefore getting uh, sort of what we believe is a fair chance of getting the ticket. And this here basically prevents uh, the way of getting an advantage by using one of the uh, very fast robot tools because no matter how fast that tool is, you're still under the randomization and will get a random position in line together with uh, everybody else. And combining the, the speed with the uh, volume protection, we will take a fair amount of uh, the simple uh, robots uh, away. and, and basically what we believe, and it's probably not 100% sure, but basically some of the, or most of the tools that you can buy for cheap money on the internet. Where it really gets uh, difficult uh, to, to do the prevention here is that what we are seeing right now is instead of operating simple tools from single computers, uh, the uh, bad guys here are spinning up like thousands of different computers and are running at a very low speed, like uh, maybe only running at a rate that per server or per IP address is only carrying like maybe five or, or 10 users. And therefore, at least from uh, our tools, it's simply just looking uh, as a couple of, of uh, users sitting in an office building sharing a IP address. If you go yeah, I think uh, to the next slide, so you yeah, sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I, I think it, it's, it's important, again, to reinforce this idea of what it means for the end user and, and how the, the multi-tiered solution helps prevent all sorts of different types of fraud, right? So we're talking about cr preventing the creation of multiple accounts. We're talking about preventing the spinner bots, preventing the volumetric um, attacks on your site and uh, in in the, the exact moments before an on sale, that's going to make sure that every person that goes into your shopping cart, into your web application, is able to 
actually get the response times that they expect. It's going to make sure that your application doesn't cr jump, fall to its knees. And it's actually, it goes beyond just bots. This is about the integrity of your application and making sure that real people don't flood it and bring their site down. Um, so this, this again goes back to the central piece of a good user experience in an on sale, making sure that it, you can you can funnel out people into your shopping cart in a systematic approach that will not crash your application. And all as you're doing that, you funnel away the malicious bots. You pull away the, the, the really aggressive scripts that might be poorly written and might take down your application. Um, so this is, this is a great way of, of, make, of, of shoring up the, the infrastructure. And, and more so, you know, Tanil, your, your, your original point about you know, the, the, the price incentive. Some people say, well, okay, that's great. You can pull away bots. What if somebody goes and hires real people? Well, this mechanism, if you layer these approaches together, you can actually effectively defeat that because it doesn't matter if they have, they hire a hundred people or even a thousand people to buy real tickets. If you put everybody into a queue all at the same time, you're going to have tens if not hundreds of thousands of legitimate users and maybe a thousand of these outsourced paid scalpers. And so that's 1% of that pool ends up going to scalpers. Now if you do nothing, then they write a bot and even if you put them into a queue, they can write a bot to have a thousand, a hundred thousand different accounts. And so 50% of your, of your queue pool ends up becoming bots. And this is why it's important to take this multifaceted layered approach because there's no silver bullet in one way. And this is why I think the partnership with Qit is so fantastic because it addresses every angle together. And, and then you, uh, uh, at a, a certain time, obviously coming out of the, the queue, your turn is up. It can maybe be 10 minutes past uh, 10 o'clock and then uh, users are coming into the actual uh, ticketing part, and then there is a lot of things that can still go on, and, and he'll give the word to you, uh, Rami, uh, on talking on, on, on some of the stuff after you sort of have left the waiting room. Well, as soon as you leave the waiting room, that's, that's the, the rest of the journey, and the rest of the journey, if you're a legitimate user, is about legitimate credit card transaction, legit legitimate checkout, et cetera. But it goes back to this, uh, this idea of automation or this idea of tracking the nefarious actors. And so one of the things that's really important to know is that without some sort of automation technology, a lot of nefarious act prevention, a lot of nefarious actors might be purchasing these tickets with stolen credit cards. And the best way to test out stolen credit cards is using bots. We find that the credit card numbers and CVC, CVC codes go for as little as 50 cents a piece on the black market. And so leveraging a wide list of credit card numbers and trying them out with one bot after another is going to be one of the most prevalent ways of committing credit card fraud. And at the end of the day, chargebacks get charged to you. And you are on the hook as a, as a technology platform for these chargebacks. And so you want to try to minimize that as much as possible. And a great way to do that is to prevent the automation of testing different credit card numbers. The, the last piece in this puzzle is tracking people that use, that exceed purchase limits. And, and purchase limits, you can say, you know what, this IP can only buy five tickets or this account can only buy five tickets. But nowadays, it is easier than ever to manipulate and hide your identity. You can create multiple accounts. You can have multiple credit card numbers. American Express, you can actually request a block of credit card numbers from American Express. It's that simple to get a number of different credit card numbers. And more importantly, it's easy, very, very easy to hide what your true IP is. And so for every single request, Somebody can go through a VPN service or Tor and hide the true nature of their IP address. And so your defenses, your, your analytics, your, your fraud has to go one step beyond an IP address. And what this still does to help you in that, in that practice is helps you identify 
individuals and accounts based on a device fingerprint. And whether you do it with the still or some other tool, it's important to level up your, your technology to make sure that you're tracking each user based on their device, not their IP, and not their cookie. And what does a device mean? That means you profile the actual machine and the browser that that person is browsing from. And you can track it no matter what IP it comes in from. The, the technology is now advanced enough that it doesn't matter if they clear their cookies. It doesn't matter if they're at home, at work, or using a proxy, you still know it's them. And with technology that powerful, you can finally enforce preventing multiple purchases from a single device, from a single computer, because the only way to get around that would be for them to actually get a new computer. And that makes it a lot more cost prohibitive to do so. Now, let's talk through about a live example of, of how one of our mutual customers has been able to combat their bot problem. Um, StubHub is not only one of the best known secondary ticketing sites in the world, but they're actually now in, involved in a lot of primary ticketing sales as well. Um, they, they came to us because they started with an account takeover problem, and they found that their accounts were being compromised, that credentials were being stuffed into these accounts, and with the compromised accounts, they saw an influx of fraud. And so using Distill, we were able to eliminate the account takeover concerns that they had and significantly reduce the number of fraudulent and new accounts created by to, down to single digits. Uh, single uh, percentage points from, from where it was before. We eliminated the entire bit of automation of fraudulent account creation. And so that was step one in their journey of preventing the, the malicious bots. The next, the next thing that they were having an issue with was ticket scraping. They found that a lot of new competitors were coming up, scraping their ticket prices, and trying to sell tickets for $1 less than them, $1, or take up their inventory, spin their inventory, and resell it for a higher amount. And what that did is it put an unfair load on their infrastructure, making it a bad user experience for their users, and at the end of the day, it stole users away from them. The, their brand was tarnished. Their, their user base, they, they lost loyalty in their user base because of the, the, the competitive um, pressures there. And so by eliminating the, the scalpers and the scrapers' ability to do that, they were able to retain their users and, and build that loyalty once again and improve the user experience. And the last bit that was really interesting is that bots were throwing off their analytics. You have an entire marketing team that is dedicating time and energy into optimizing your funnel, creating it, making it so that people can transact as quickly as possible and making decisions day in and day out based on what they think is a transaction path for your end users. But if we go back to the, the very beginning and we said 20% of your traffic are these malicious bots that aren't there to interact with whatever marketing creates, whatever decisions you make, 20% is going to completely skew any kind of decision you're making. And so without a mechanism to filter out the, the bots from your analytics, you're not going to have a clear understanding of what to do and how to optimize your funnel and what, what things matter. You don't really know what your conversion rates are and what your conversion funnel looks like until you clean up these bots. And that's another piece that made it even more important for them to clean out their bots. Yeah, and uh, we, we have, of course, been uh, able to help uh, StopHop on their primary selling uh, platform. They uh, were very uh, fast to get the idea about the 20-minute timeline to sell out, and therefore uh, we have uh, been uh, helping them with uh, primary ticketing uh, outside U.S. Uh, and on their uh, platform where they are also using Distill. And it's very clear that using uh, sort of this, uh, what uh, we will call the layered approach, have been able to effectively get what we believe is 100% of the malicious activity away during these uh, on-sales. And we're talking uh, on-sales in 
in uh, multiple thousands of uh, users uh, buying uh, tickets and have done that uh, a, a good number of times. And uh, we believe it, and, and more importantly, uh, uh, the uh, guys at StopHop actually also think that we were able to get most of the malicious traffic away by using this multi-layered approach. Fantastic! What a what so, a what a uh, great uh, yeah. yeah. I was going to say what a what a great presentation. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Neil. Did you have another another uh, point you wanted to make? No, uh, just go ahead here with the uh, final wrap up. Okay, great. Yeah, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, we have a number of questions coming in through the GoToWebinar console, and uh, I encourage everyone to ask their questions now. Uh, as I'll pose them uh, to Rami and Neil live. And we have a few questions. So uh, the first question is, how secure are the systems and how much do you actually catch? Uh, Rami, do you want to take that one? Well, it, you know, if we knew what we didn't know, uh, it would m make it a lot easier to catch them. But uh, it, so it's always a hard question to, to answer. What we like to think is, uh, I, I'll be the first to say there's no solution that's 100%. Um, but, but we have at the still over 100 engineers, over 200 employees that are dedicated to solving this problem. And so the, 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 the place in which we can get and help customers achieve protection is going to be much further than where they can achieve on their own. Uh, more importantly, we have the widest base of customers in the bot market. And what that allows us to do is not just for StubHub or ASX or, or hundreds of other customers, we can aggregate this data together. So when we catch one, one malicious actor for one customer, we share that knowledge across our entire customer base. So we, we see a wider viewpoint in the world than, than everybody else does, and that helps, that helps us be more effective in, in catching it. To, to answer the, the question simply, though, I, I like to say that we're about 95% efficient. But there's going to be that last 5% that's always going to be hard to catch. And we actually offer professional services as an outsourced security operations team that can help you close that last 5% gap. Um, but, but our automated platform can get you 90 to 95% of the way there. Uh, thanks, Rami. I've got I'll a question here. That, yeah, okay, yeah. Go ahead, Neil. Yep. Yeah, I would say that you need to consider this as a arms race uh, because the money that you can actually earn by uh, getting the tickets away is so high, and therefore whatever measures we are putting in here, someone will try to analyze it uh, and, and probe it, and, and the next time they will try uh, new stuff. So it will be, be a continuous process on closing all the holes here. Great. Um, so here's a question coming in. This person's asking, they, they're saying, all right, large primary ticketing companies have internal fraud teams. Is there a mechanism we can feed information to your protection layers so we can tell you what happens post-sale to improve the protection? I don't know so which absolutely. one you want to take that. Yeah, yeah okay. You know, I, I, I think interaction between what we catch and what you catch is critical. We, we work with our customers to have a feedback loop to make sure that we understand the things that we may have missed and, and get out ahead of it um, for the next time. We also give the customer automated mechanisms in which they can interact with their portal and put in fraudulent fingerprints, lock fraudulent devices, um, and, and flag the, the, the malicious behavior so that we can prevent it ahead of time in the future without them having to catch it all over again. So the, the, the back and forth interaction, I think, is, is a great part of of uh, a team that, that has a company that does have a, a fraud team already. Great. Um, here's another question coming in. This person is asking, we are very happy customers of Qit. Um, how would Distill be implemented with Qit? Um, does it require us to divert our website traffic through third-party infrastructure? Well, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, we, we, we try to offer a, a solution to, to, to be able to do this in a number of different ways. And so we can integrate with Qit in the, the, the funnel as traffic is going over to the redirect, um, or we can integrate it on your site. We recommend locking down your site um, and, and 
and putting either an on-premise proxy or a cloud proxy um, to, to be able to see 100% of the purview of what comes across. But we, we can work with you to, to, to create a solution that integrates well and is, is within your comfort zone. So, so there's no one answer to that. It really depends on your architecture and your needs. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and yeah, uh, plus exactly what 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 is what what is the use case here? Um, uh, because is is it uh, like a one-time big on sale that that you have coming, for example, because Hamilton is visiting uh, your venue, uh, or is that uh, more like a ongoing solution you have to? It? And and again, there is multiple answers to the uh, question here. Yeah. All right, so, so someone else is asking, uh, how do I get started? Um, and actually, I think we have uh, uh, a, a couple of free trial offers. Both companies offer free trials. Um, you can see those free trial links uh, on your screen there. Uh, we'll also be uh, following up with everyone afterwards with the slides and other opportunities to have a more personal conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Niels and Rami, for a great show today. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending.